Hello, Fosdan. I'm Riccardo Binetti, and today I'm going to talk to you about a starter, uh, what it is, and uh, what we built with it, and why I think uh, you should use it. So, first of all, uh, some things about me. Uh, I'm uh, Riccardo Binetti, uh, also known as Arbino online. Uh, this is my website, GitHub page, Twitter, etc. I'm a cloud specialist at SecoMind uh, in Padova, Italy. And I started out there as an embedded Qt uh, C++ developer, but now I'm almost uh, full-time developing in Elixir. So why delivering data is not enough for an IoT project? So IoT may seem like an already solved problem and, and an overused buzzword, but, but it's actually not because there are some aspects of IoT uh, which are uh, still open and are not usually handled properly by the existing platforms. So first of all, authentication. So many platforms uh, just uh, has few for a username and a password or don't even uh, bother to do that. So uh, basically any device can act as any other device and publish data uh, for, for, each, for each other without any kind of control. Then there is data modeling. So uh, many IoT solutions don't force you to declare the shape of data. And this is very fine to start out because you say, oh, okay, I can send any random JSON on this platform and it will digest it. But it actually takes away guarantees from your system because when you want to have a, a, an integer and you instead receive a string, then there is some kind of mismatch that you, you can solve uh, without having some structure in the data. And you should you can think of this uh, as the difference be between schema and schemaless database. The, the other problem that many solutions have is the one size fits all approach, because uh, usually IoT platforms are uh, a shiny dashboard, uh, so you say, okay, I want to see my data graphed uh, and uh, I want gauges and graphs uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, nice. But when you want to build something with your data that is not what the default frontend is showing you, uh, it, it, gets, it gets hard really quick. And so uh, what the start is trying to solve is also this problem by exposing data uh, by API instead of widgets. So, which are the results of all of this? Uh, usually, each new uh, client, each new uh, person who has to build its own IoT platform, uh, instead of adapting an existing one, starts to roll their own. And uh, there is a, a lot of reinventing the wheel. Smart devices are not so smart and uh, they are taking over quickly. And uh, if everyone implements its own IoT platform, possibly buggy and so on, uh, this, when the singularity happens, uh, you won't be able even to put your shoes on to run away. So let's introduce a started. Astarte is an open source data orchestration platform focused on IoT. So the approach that Astarte uses is that uh, we know that everyone has, has slightly different requirements for their IoT platform. So there are different device protocols and uh, different applications that uses the device data. And Astarte tries to solve this by focusing on the common big blocks and make it easy to integrate custom stuff you might need. Uh, which are, uh, what are the components that may make up Astarte? Astarte itself is a set of microservices with a written in Elixir. And it's made to be modular and replaceable if needed. So each microservice is uh, uh, is replaceable with your own implementation if you need. And it's designed to be Kubernetes native. Then there are devices DK that cover a lot of different use cases. So we have SDKs for Qt5, C on ESP32, 
Go, Java, Elixir, Rust, Python, JavaScript, you name it, and much uh, other SDKs on, are on the way. And then there is a Stata flow, which uh, is a, a separate uh, project from the Astata microservices, and it's a data processing framework focused on reusable blocks and pipelines. So let me introduce some of the Astarte concepts uh, which can be useful to understand uh, all what we are doing inside of Astarte. First of all, how we model data. Interfaces. Interfaces are uh, what are the data modeling primitive we use in Astarte. So uh, there are JSON files and a device usually supports multiple interfaces and it declares its capabilities where, when it connects or when a new interface is added or removed. Interfaces can be shared across different devices, so you have uh, uniform data access uh, between different devices implementing the same interface. Uh, the interface versioning adheres to semantic versionings. versioning. This means that if a device uh, supports a 1.0 interface, uh, the 1.1 interface can only implement a subset of the operations which are allowed in the interface update. And this make sure, makes sure that all devices with a 1.0 and 1.1 interface are compatible with each other. And the API that is generated for a device is derived from its interfaces. Uh, there are some... Uh, some uh, properties of the interfaces. The first is there are two different types, data stream and properties. Uh, data stream are stateless ordered stream of data. So you can think of it uh, as sensor samples, commands, events. Uh, so all values are registered. If you sample a temperature, uh, you now say it's 20 degrees, uh, then in, in a minute it's 21 degrees. All these samples are saved in the database. While properties are stateful, synchronized state with no history. So if you're just interested in the current state of the device uh, for a specific thing, then you have to use a property interface and actually only the last value is saved. And the uh, properties have um, are, have the implicit guarantee that uh, that just the correct uh, last value is saved. So uh, it, they are implicitly uh, sent with QS2 on MQTT, for example. Here you can see uh, an example of, a, of an interface, uh, of a JSON file of an interface. Here you can see the interface name, uh, the measure minor version, and the, the type. So, for example, uh, this is a properties interface. The ownership is another important uh, aspect of the interface, can be either device or server. Device interfaces are the ones which, uh, where the device publishes the data, while server-owned interfaces are the, the one where the server owns the data. So, uh, with a starter, it's possible to both receive data from the field and send commands to the devices and all is described with uh, these interfaces. As you can see, uh, an interface uh, contains an array of mappings. Uh, these are rather minimal in this example, so you have uh, uh, multiple endpoints uh, and you, if you can see, you can also have parameters inside the endpoint. So, with this interface and these mappings, you can represent the humidity and the temperature of multiple rooms by changing the room ID when you send a message. And each endpoint uh, as a is mapped to a specific type. So uh, the usual types are supposed to uh, support a double uh, integer, long integer, uh, string, uh, daytime, uh, binary blob, and their corresponding array version. So double array, etc., etc. And inside mappings, you can also have additional properties, like, for example, you can define the database TTL. So a value can uh, be saved in the database only for a uh, limited amount of time if you want. 
uh, or you can uh, define the QS, which is used to publish uh, the data on the device side and some other properties that you can uh, find in the started documentation. But basically, this is the most minimal example you can think of when thinking about interfaces. And the, the semantic versioning I was talking about earlier basically means that uh, if I do a new uh, minor version of this interface, the only thing I can change is that I can add new endpoints. So uh, the devices supporting the, the 1.0 interface still are compatible because they are just not going to send data in a new endpoint for the new endpoints. Uh, but I can't change uh, the type of endpoints, I can't change the type of ownership and so on. So I can guarantee that they are compatible. Okay. So uh, on the credentials management side, we have uh, the pairing uh, component, uh, which is the component dedicated to emitting and renewing credentials. It signs SSL client certificate, which are used to perform SSL mutual authentication with the MQTT broker when the device connects with it. And uh, all the SDK just take care of this uh, uh, in a transparent way, so the, the, the user does not have to uh, care about uh, credentials renewal or requesting it. It just gives the credential secret to the SDK and it performs all the needed operation. How does the pairing flow work? So you have the agent, the, the entity that is in charge of registering devices, and it registers the device and obtains a credential secret. This operation can happen either during manufacturing, so you ship out devices which already have the credential secret, uh, for example, burned in an OTP, or directly on the device. So we support both use cases. After that, the device has this credential secret and it exchanges this credential secret with actual credential. Uh, in the SSL mutual authentication case, the device sends a certificate signing request and pairing API returns a signed certificate to the device, uh, verifying that the credential secret the device sent is actually is, is its own. And uh, device credentials can and should be short-lived and uh, because the SDK just renews it for you. So you can have a very short-lived certificate and uh, don't care if the device gets compromised. Another important concept uh, inside Astarte are triggers, which are a way to perform an action when a specific condition is met. So basically, uh, triggers are uh, are JSON descriptions uh, like interfaces, but this way, instead of describing the shape of data, they describe some condition and some action. Uh, the currently supported actions allow to send HTTP requests or publishing a message to a RabbitMQ exchange. So you either have a, a webhook on the a webhook uh, which receives the HTTP request on the other end or you can have uh, an application which consumes uh, uh, from a RabbitMQ queue and uh, you can use that to uh, receive uh, filtered data because you don't uh, receive all the data coming from a started but just the one that matches the condition and act on it. So you can uh, uh, populate uh, your uh, application backend, uh, you can uh, uh, you can use a starter flow as we're going to see later. Uh, you can, the, the important thing is that this act as, acts as a funnel. So you uh, just have a subset of data you're interested in and you can react to it. Here you can see an example of a trigger. Uh, and uh, uh, as you can see, the you have a trigger name and you have the here are the conditions which are uh, expressed as a as an array of simple triggers right now uh, we are not uh, yet uh, supporting uh, combining simple triggers with the complex operations but it's on the roadmap 
Uh, so here, for example, you are defining that when uh, incoming data, when, when a data is received on this interface with this interface measure on uh, on this specific path, so you can, uh, if you recall from uh, from early. Uh, the, the the room ID was actually parametric, so you can match on specific uh, instances of the path. Uh, then you send a, a post to this URL, and this this uh, this allows you to react to specific uh, rooms uh, receiving data. But uh, for for the there are also additional conditions. So you can also say, for example, for numeric uh, values, you can say uh, if it's uh, less than uh, some uh, defined value, or if uh, less uh, more than or it's greater than, uh, or you can match uh, string uh, string values, uh, and uh, you can uh, you can also define. The, you can also check if uh, a value is contained uh, in an array so you can uh, you can pretty much uh, have uh, you pretty much have uh, a very fine grain control on what data is passing the, the trigger condition and uh, triggering the action so the uh, outermost part of a starter are transports and the responsibility of a transport is converting incoming data to the starting data representation, uh, which is uh, Bison and uh, INQP metadata, since uh, all data flowing inside, inside a starter uh, passes through RabbitMQ, and uh, and the, the transport gets the out the data coming from the device and translates it to this format and delivers it to RabbitMQ. Currently, we provide an MQTT transport working with the available SDKs out of the box. It's implemented as a Vernon Q plugin. Uh, it has mandatory SSL mutual authentication, and the protocol is well documented, so you can roll your own compatible SDK. So you if if for some reason we don't cover your use case for our, with our SDKs, you can always uh, take the protocol and uh, roll your own SDK. Or you can uh, uh, provide your own transport. So for example, if you have an existing application uh, which just sends a plain MQTT data, you can always uh, uh, write a different uh, VernonQ plugin uh, which uh, translates that data to the start uh, format. So th this is another reason, uh, another way we offer uh, some more flexibility uh, for, for our users. So I'm going to talk to you uh, about the start components. So all the microservices which uh, are effectively, effectively making up a start. Uh, here you can see an eye level view to, of the components. So all user facing APIs are uh, have an API suffix, uh, as you can imagine. So there is a uh, App Engine API, Housekeeping API, Real Management API, and Pairing API. Uh, all all uh, API services except uh, App Engine API. Uh, have a corresponding backend service, uh, and actually th this communication between services uh, is passing on RabbitMQ with an RPC protocol, and uh, so basically uh, this this is done so that uh, users can actually replace any of these services if they adhere to the the same RPC protocol. Then there is trigger engine, data data plan, which is responsible of